My name is um, Carlton Cartwright. I'm the executive director of the Children's Coalition Incorporated and I'm also the chairperson for the Veterans Caucus of Palm Beach County. Um, we're here with, what is your name, Miss? Ann Raleigh. So it's a tri-service program. It was all of the students were military, mostly Army, Medical Service Corps, but there were a few nurses there and um, there were a few Air Force and a few Navy. There were five Navy and three Air Force and the rest in the class, which was 30 some people. Um, but anyway, it's a graduate program. The, the degree came from Baylor University. So, um, so that was a year didactic program in, in, at Fort Sam in San Antonio. And then we had to do an admin residency, which I did at Camp Pendleton, at the Navy Hospital in Camp Pendleton, mm -hmm. California, the Marine base there. And, um, and there was one other, one of the other Navy classmates was with me on that residency program. And you basically just studied all about hospital administration, how it applied in a, in a real hospital. Right. So then I graduated in 82 from that program, and I was stationed at San Diego. Was again, now I was in administration. I was supervisor. How long were you at San Diego? For two, two years? years? Okay. Yeah, two mm -hmm. years. And so I was a supervisor, but then the Navy decided that that wasn't a utilization tour. So then I went to a regional command up in Oakland, California, a Navy uh, medical regional command. And that was a totally different job. Then I had to handle all kinds of programs in the Navy, you know, in, in, for the region, which included all the way up to Alaska. It included Northern California and um, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. So um, I'd have to travel around to all these different bases and see how their medical facilities were doing and, you know, things like that. And then there were a whole bunch of different programs that I had to manage um, in the region. So that was, a, that was my utilization tour. Then, though, they offered me, I got promoted <laughs> and, or got selected for promotion to 06. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, who could say no to London, right? And that my job there was at a regional command under Naval Forces Europe. So I got to travel all over Europe to visit our medical facilities. Where would you get to go? Okay. Oh, I got to go to Italy, to Spain, to tri-service meetings in Germany. And I met up with my Baylor classmates, my Army Baylor classmates <laughs> okay. there. Anyway, so um, the yep. European tour was great. Right. You know, I mean, who could not want to travel on, on Uncle Sam's you know, dime and be able to see all these places in Europe and... Um, so I really enjoyed that, and it was just, it was interesting. And there were other things about it that weren't so interesting, some of them which I still can't talk about because I don't know if it's ever been declassified. Right, <laughs> I was, yeah. So there were things that were going on at the time. This was from, uh, I was there from 87 to 89. Hold on, sorry. No, it's good, we're good. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. So, 87 to 89, then I went to Portsmouth, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So, the big Navy Medical Center there, I was stationed there. Um, and But I wasn't there very long. I was there, uh, I guess it was about nine months. And then the first Gulf, the invasion of Kuwait happened. And so I was on the, um, uh, I was, you know, also on the platform for the fleet hospital. So then I got deployed to Saudi Arabia for seven months for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. But it was a little different from Vietnam because now instead of being one of the staff, I was the director of nursing at the Fleet Hospital. Right. So that was in, um, and I can talk about that, that was in El Jabal in Saudi Arabia. So we went right at the beginning. Uh, we got there on the 1st of September uh -huh. in, what was it, 1990. Is that when that happened? Yeah, 1990. And um, so we were, it was only at the time, we were so close to the Kuwait border. There was just, it was about a two hour drive and we were at the Kuwait border. Right. And there was only a Marine Brigade between us and that was all that was there at that point in that part of uh, Saudi Arabia. So, um, so we got our hospital set up and um, we called it the Kmart Hospital because mm -hmm. we weren't set up in the sand. Mm -hmm. The area coordinator, the Marine General, and the Saudis wanted us set up at the port, so we set up on a on a parking lot in the port. Right. So we always said that's what we would do for reunions. We would go to a Kmart parking lot. <laughs> 
and yeah. get together. You had little jokes, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, in medical, you have a lot of jokes. It's the only way you get through it. Right. But, um, and I, all service people do that. Uh, but, yeah, so we were, we were set up there. We started, we were ready to go within a couple of weeks. We were, had everything set up and we were ready to go. We were taking patients. You know, just the as the buildup was occurring, of course, there were the usual folks getting hurt, you know. So, um, and then because it was a parking lot, uh -huh. it was easy to set up an LZ for the, um, for the uh, choppers. So we What does that mean, LZ, for the... A landing zone for the choppers. Gotcha. So we set one up. And, um, and, in fact, we had the Black Hawk squadrons coming and practicing. Right. Because they... We actually went on one of the Black Hawk helicopters, a few of us, out to, they wanted to practice landing on one of the big hospital ships, because yeah. the Navy had two big hospital ships, the Mercy and the uh, Comfort, and they wanted to practice landing on a hospital ship, so we took a ride out with them to, I guess it was the Mercy, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so we had those squad, and then we'd have others come and just use our, you know, practice on our helicopter pad there really so yeah 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 okay. had the brits come the rommels uh the uh, desert rats they called them really they were the descendants of the the original desert rats that had fought against rommel in oh the okay Africa. yeah yeah rat patrol yeah 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 right <laughs> right right exactly okay. yeah so it was pretty it was actually pretty cool so and then the war was very short of course uh -huh. as we know what was the casualty rate Oh, I don't remember the rate, but yeah. we had very few. I, we only had two at our hospital. We were oh. set up for huge numbers. Right. I mean, they kept telling us. I mean, we were a 500-bed hospital. Wow. Uh, uh, what they call deployable medical system. So oh. it was all sitting in a, in a, um, on, in these big containers. It was all pre-positioned ahead of time in Diego Garcia, so they brought all that stuff from Diego Garcia that had been sitting there since the 80s. Uh -huh. And it still worked. So we were, you know, this, we had a big CB, two CB units with us to do the most of the setup. I mean, our staff helped, but they were the ones who led the setup. What is the CB unit? The CBs, the construction battalions in the Navy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, it, they're called CBs. <laughs> they're like... You see old John Wayne movies with the CBs. Right, gotcha. I was yeah, wondering. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. But it's it's C letter C letter B right. CBs. But then construction. Yeah, but then they eventually had their logo was was this B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Busy as a B. Yeah, right. This yeah. The CBs, the CBs. <laughs> you bet. And they were all. I mean. The thing about the CBs that I was like, we, we had them in Vietnam as well because they had built the hospital that I was in in Vietnam as well. And the thing about them is they can do everything, mm. you name it, and they can find everything. Right. If you need something, somehow they always know where to get it. <laughs> really? Yeah. So they were resourceful? Very. Okay. <laughs> Probably right. you didn't want to know. How right, yeah. They yeah. Were. You need to just go ahead and. Uh, <laughs> and accept. <laughs> yeah, leave that alone, huh? I get you. I guess. So, anyway. All right. Um, just moving right along. So, how long were you in Kuwait? Well, Saudi Arabia. Saudi yeah, Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Okay. Until yeah, uh, after the war ended, and I was there for seven months. Okay. Seven months, yeah. All right. So. Um, what did you do after that? Then I came back to Portsmouth, Virginia, but then they sent me to work on the TRICARE, TRI-Service, um, which was a, there was a demonstration project for... Um, for the TRICARE program, which was a medical program that DOD, was, Department of Defense, was developing okay. at the time. So I worked on that until it was time to, like not even two years, um, to go to Charleston, South Carolina. And that was my last duty station. I was director of nursing in Charleston at the hospital there. At okay. The hospital. Um, and so... And then I, you know, decided to retire because I liked the duty station and I knew that if I stayed in for the extra, I could have stayed in two more years, but they would have sent me to, to Washington and I really didn't want to get in the middle of that okay. stuff. <laughs> too much politics gotcha. for me. So, yeah, and my husband's health was failing. I mean, I knew, you know, we knew that he wasn't doing so well. Right. That was another reason. So altogether, how many years did you do? So, 26 active and two years reserve. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, when you, where were you when you separated? 
Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, I okay. retired from Charleston. Now, before we get out of the service, while you were in the service, um, what was the food like? It was hospital food. I mean, it's never good. <laughs> I don't care what hospital you go to. It has nothing to do with the service. Actually, their their best food was breakfast. Uh -huh. You know, you could always... I'd get off night duty when I was uh, stationed at San Diego, and I'd always go to the chow hall for breakfast because the breakfasts were very good. Right, okay. I'll tell you where the best food was in the Navy was the submarines. Really? Well, because, I mean, they, they go under the water for... I, I'm not going to talk about how many days. I'm not going to be like Trump and, and tell you how many. Right. <laughs> because I, I'm sure that's still classified. But <laughs> anyway, uh -huh. they got lobster and they got... <laughs> but they deserved it. I yeah. mean, that kind of duty. Yeah, I that's say, very strenuous. I say feed them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> feed them. Let them eat, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. and not, don't let them eat crow. Did you have all the supplies that you needed throughout the service? Um, you did. We did in Vietnam. Uh -huh. um, we did in, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, we did. But lots of times, you if you were medical, you were kind of at the end of the funding line when during peacetime. That's weird. Yeah. So you didn't always get. I mean, we we struggled with our budgets every year at the different hospitals that I was stationed at. And lots of times we would, you know, request stuff that we were weren't just weren't going to get. Uh -huh. And it was hard to tell people that you're, we don't have it. You know, the pharmacies pretty much were stocked, but that was a big ticket item. And, you know, that could get, that budget could be busted easily. And then you'd be begging for, you know, for more money from D.C. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's the old guns and butter and uh, routine. You know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes... The, what is guns and butter? Well, the, the weapons are more important than the food. Got you know, it. That, okay. Know, All right. You know, yeah. It's like, and the people stuff. And the, the problem was I was there for the transition to the all-volunteer force. Right. You know, the draft was over with. And what I don't think, even today, that politicians don't understand is it's much more expensive to have an all-volunteer force. You have to provide. I mean, we were now um, bringing in, recruiting people with... Well, they already had families. They already had a ton of dependents. Right. You know, family members that we had to care for. And they didn't... Congress didn't want to fund that, you know? Right. They wanted to fund more weapons and more, you know, because it brings pork back home and things like that. But they didn't always want to fund the people programs that we needed. You know, not just medical, but certainly. And then you had all, the whole transition of women being allowed to stay in after they had children that wasn't allowed when I came on active duty. Right. In fact, there was um, a lot of discrimination against women because I could be married, but my husband couldn't be my dependent. Yet right. a male could be married and his wife would be his dependent. Uh-huh. Um, which meant, you know, access to all the benefits. Right. But it was just because I was female that I, you know, and... <laughs> I mean, a male, it could be somebody whose wife was a millionaire. You right, know? yeah. It wouldn't matter. She would still have all the benefits, whereas my husband would not. And so that was, you know, it started to change when they went to all volunteer because they would have, they would have had to change. Right. Or they Because nowadays, it's like 15% of the active duty forces are female, mm -hmm. and they couldn't manage without them. So they had to change. They really did. Okay. And it has changed a lot, I think, over the years. It's gotten better? Well, I think there's gotten more opportunities for women. Everything okay. is open. I, but I was going to ask you. Yeah, all what, of the, what, everything's open. Were there, what were the issues that you faced being a woman in the service? Just being a woman. It but, was the same as you would face in any big organization. Okay, so it was where, rough. Yeah. Well, it was just that even though the nurse corps was mostly female, my right. own, you know, yeah. group, it didn't matter. You were still at the low end of the totem pole. Right. Both as a nurse, you were considered the low end, and as a female, you were too. So... Even though it was your responsibility to save people's lives. Yeah, right. I mean... <laughs> But you know, it's sublime is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of things that I could tell you that, but it, it, that's basically how it was. And even nowadays, nurses don't get the recognition that they should. Not just in the in the medical community, in the military, but in the in the civilian community, we could do a lot more. Um, we could provide a lot more health care to people. 
if we would allow nurses, nurse practitioners and so on to be out there providing primary care, it would it would open up the, the health care hey, for I didn't a lot even of think people, of that. You know. Yeah. And that's important. Of course I well <laughs> I don't want to get into my political stuff now. <laughs> no, I mean, it's okay. I mean, politically, how do you yeah, feel about what's yeah. going on today in it's women's horrible. world? Well, it's it's better for women, but it's still, we haven't, we have come a long way, but it's not the whole way. I mean, there's still, you know, the pay issues, the um, reproductive rights. You know, people talk about reproductive rights, and they talk about just abortion. But you know what? Reproductive rights and having control over your body affects not just women, but men as well. Right. Because there were things that were done to men who were, like, um, some of the things that were done to men who were prisoners or military, they were experimented on. Mm -hmm. And didn't, you know, that's taking control of someone else's body. Right. They didn't give you permission to do that. So... I think we, people need to, when they look at women's issues as far as reproductive rights, need to look beyond that to the whole picture of how if we don't let women have control over their bodies, right. then pretty soon there's going to be, and there has been in the past, minorities are going to be controlled. Uh, that's a, it's a slippery slope. I don't know if I'm making my point, but you know. Yeah, you are. I, just, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Just... I mean, you and it's fine to talk about it. This yeah. is a good good place to talk about this because number one, you have the experience. Number well, number one, you're a nurse, <laughs> which which I mean, in, in my own opinion, I mean, um, so many nurses from what I've seen and conversations I've had, nurse is a doctor. Well, <laughs> I'm not even going to say practically. No, I, I've seen enough. I think I believe I've seen enough nurses that have stayed have have stayed in that career field long enough to actually be the doctor. Oh, often, and you know there are still remote parts of the world where they are. They are, and just even in the United States. Right, right. So, um, yeah, as far as you know, your your uh, uh, capacity, or um, as well as, as far as you being qualified uh, to talk about all the different levels involved in medicine. Definitely, that's in place. Yeah, and I think, I guess, see, it really bothers me that in a wealthy country like we have, mm -hmm. that everybody doesn't have access to health care, that everybody doesn't have access to a good education. You know, that doesn't mean they necessarily take advantage of it, but the fact that it's there and they can pay for it, because access doesn't mean anything if you can't pay for it. That means you don't have access. Right. If you don't have a way to pay for your health care. I believe in single payer. I, I lived in England and used the National Health Service there uh -huh. because they open it. Interestingly enough, the National Health Service, when you're with the forces and stationed in England, uh -huh. you, you use their health system because we didn't have any hospitals, big hospitals or anything separate. You know, So if you needed health care, that's what you did. Okay. You registered with your GP and you know you got taken care of. If you needed it. Now, I didn't. I was healthy. I didn't need much. But it was right. just nice to know it was there. And some of my colleagues did use it, some of the active duty members, and they were perfectly happy with it. Said it was a good system. Mm. So, and basically the whole military medical system is totally socialized medicine. Anybody will tell you that it's not is lying. <laughs> because you're, everything's taken care of. Right. You know? Well, except for dental. Yeah, no, dental's taken care of when you're on active duty. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's all taken care of. And okay. your family members get almost all of that as well. Right, okay. So, if they're, you know. Well, I don't know. It's just this huge issue about taking care of people in the country. And I mean, I mean, there's, you know, uh, like you're saying, the socialized medicine in other countries is a lot better. Uh, than, than what we have to offer people here. Yeah, we, and they spend a lot less than we do. But, I mean, you know, I mean, this is your interview, but we just talk about, you know, the, the political aspect for a minute. Um, to me, it almost seems like uh, the lack of dispensing the health care leads directly to people dying. Uh -huh. So, yeah. hence, the possibility of this is a... Uh, the uh, uh, 
the avenue that is being taken to control population in the United States as well. Yeah, yeah, well, and it's it's a class base. Because people will it's die, I believe. Based. Oh, yeah. they will, well, and they died before. And oh, absolutely, now, absolutely, know, yes, of and course it's class based. And it's it's definitely economically based right. and, and class. I mean, and it's certainly racially, sexually, I mean, there's so many things. All of those categories. All those categories. Mm -hmm. But that's the bottom line. And in the olden days, before health insurance was even something that people had, um, the rich people always got the care they needed. Right. It, it never was a problem. The poor people didn't want to go to the local public hospital because you went there to die. And that's what they knew. Hmm. That people weren't getting. So, and there's so many other issues. I mean, I could get into the mental health issues. And, I mean, there's just so much. And you see, and when you know other countries are doing a better job of it, right? that's upsetting. What about the mental health issues? Just, you know, just, there's just not enough. We, we closed up a lot of the state hospitals and so on back uh -huh. in the 80s. Right. And we mainstreamed all these people out into the communities, but we didn't give the communities the resources to take care of them. So what happened? They became part of the prison population, and that fueled the growth of our prison industries. Again, I think that the problem is now so few people ever serve. That was one of the good things about the draft. Right. Is that at least for the guys, you know, the, the greater portion of the population did serve. Um, even if it was just they did their two years in the army or whatever. But they had that experience. And I think there's something good about that experience in that people didn't stay home. They went someplace else. Right. So they got exposed to maybe a different part of the country, if not a different part of the world. Um, and I think that's that helps in a, uh, your personal education to widen your view that maybe what you learned in your little hometown wasn't the only way that people lived or people did things. I, I think we miss that now that it's only like 1% of the population ever serves in the military. Um, I think the other bad thing that happened during Vietnam was that people could get out of serving if they were wealthy enough or connected enough to. And that's, that's actually always been true. I right. guess during the Civil War they could sell their, you know, commissions and things like that or their enlistments to immigrants, immigrants of all, you know, right. <laughs> who else? Um, but um, I think that's bad too. If you're going to, I think everybody would benefit for some kind of national service mm -hmm. away from wherever they, you know, were born and raised, just right. having that exposure. But that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> okay, well, um, is there anything that you feel like we've left out of this interview that you'd like to share? Um, I think there's the um, issue of, and it didn't, I was fortunate, it never happened to me, but military, military sexual trauma, and it happens to men as well as women still, and I think that's a real issue that needs to be um, talked about a bit more. Um, <sighs> do you mean sexual abuse within well, the uh, services? Yes, assault. Okay. Yeah, I think that's still an issue from everything I've gathered. Did you witness... A certain amount of that while you were I knew about yes on active yes, duty yes absolutely okay. absolutely and, absolutely. and so, in other words you're saying it happened to uh, both genders yes yeah I didn't know so much about it happening to men I learned about that after I retired really? but okay. I knew it was happening to women uh -huh. I knew about in fact I knew about a, a specific case in Philadelphia so yeah okay. um, so and and most of us had been exposed to a certain amount of sexual harassment, of course. Uh, and that still goes on, not just in the military, but in right. plenty of organizations. Society it's, a, it's a cultural issue that we need to address. Right. And the interesting thing is the military is often the ones to address these things before the general culture does. I mean, they were ahead on equal opportunity. They weren't always good at it, but they were ahead at addressing equal opportunity before many civilian organizations had I even realized that. It. I realize Yeah, you. yeah. Okay. And that was back in the mid-70s that they were really going out and doing a lot of um, uh, equal opportunity. You know, they'd have teams that came around to the different commands. So, yeah. So we can, we can change. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you very much for your service. Oh. And welcome. thank you to for giving me the opportunity to interview you. Thank you so much for the interview. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>